Black Riders, also known as German Reiters, were some of the most sought-after mercenaries in early modern Europe. Throughout the 16th century, the Black Riders participated in many of the countless battles between Catholics and Protestants, where they found new ways of dealing with the widespread pike and shot formations, influenced the tactics of many European armies and slowly but steadily replaced the old medieval lancers. Their cost efficiency, tactics and armament were, and still are, subject to scholarly debate. But undeniably, the Black Riders' new ways of fighting changed the face of Western European warfare strongly and lastingly. This video explains how contemporary historiography deals with the controversial topic of cavalry warfare in the 16th century. From the 14th to the 16th century, heavy cavalry encountered increasingly difficult odds on the battlefield. The historian Clifford J. Rogers noted that early on archers and crossbowmen tended to aim for the horses and hide behind field fortifications when dealing with cavalry, for example at the battles of Crécy or Angincourt. Also, infantry units increasingly armed themselves with long pikes to counter cavalry, for example the Swiss or the Landsknecht during the Burgundian and Italian wars. Later, in the 16th century, cavalry faced better and better guns. Suddenly, mounted noblemen regularly found their demise at an ever-increasing distance, and if they managed to close in on infantry, they were met with pikes of 5 meters length. According to the influential military historian Michael Roberts, quote, direct assault with lance and sword became increasingly suicidal for cavalrymen, end quote. Consequently, most cavalrymen of Europe initially thickened their and their horses' armor, but for the heavy lancers, this merely led to even higher armament costs. Apart from that, the horses of the heavy knights were some of the stronger breeds, and thus required more fodder. This was not just a money problem, but also meant that it was difficult to provide food for the horses. They frequently starved to death on longer campaigns. Moreover, due to the feudal structure, these aristocrats were often accompanied by a small band of servants and footmen, who needed food and pay too. All of this added to the already extreme costs which went into purchasing and training the very rare horses suited for this task. Such expenditures ruined more than a few nobles. The need for more flexibility on the battlefield and the cost inefficiency of the heavy lancers produced new types of cavalrymen. At first, the demi-lancer, a lighter lancer unit, less armored, usually with an open-faced helmet and generally more flexible, and eventually the cuirassiers. Technically, the black riders from Germany were such cuirassiers. They were in use for much of the 16th and 17th century. Cuirassiers in general, however, were used longer than that. Most famously perhaps by Napoleon, who used them to great effect in the early 19th century. It was in 1546 during the Schmalkaldic War, however, when the Black Riders made their first appearance. Because they were mercenaries exposed to fierce competition, the Black Riders had to be hyper-efficient from a financial point of view. So, in order to have an advantage over the heavy knights, they quickly abandoned the expensive armor. They ditched the horse armor entirely and used the so-called trot armor. Some call it three-quarter armor, which did not protect the legs all the way down, but allowed for better control of the horse. These sets of armor were often made of inferior steel. For the steel to be resistant to rusting, armorsmiths used acid, which darkened the armor, making it black and thus giving the black riders their name. Over the course of time, these armors were mass-produced with exchangeable parts, which made them even more cost-effective. Later on, cuirassiers would use a simple breastplate for their own protection, a piece called a cuirass. The Black Riders also changed things up in the weaponry department. While the French and Burgundian heavy knights in royal services still relied on charges with lances, the Black Riders integrated gunpowder weapons early on, in particular the wheel lock pistol. Due to the rather average force of these early pistols, they were essentially melee weapons. One horseman could carry up to six of them at a time, which allowed them to outrange the swords of the knights in cavalry engagements who usually dropped their lances after the charge. Another vital advantage of the pistol was that it was much simpler to master. Almost anyone could pick up a pistol and put it to good use, but it required hours upon hours of training for both man and horse to master the lance. 
In spite of all these innovations, during the 16th century, fights between lancers and black riders could still go either way. Overall though, the black riders' pistols opened up new ways of dealing with enemy pike formations, to which the lancers of the heavy knights didn't find a satisfying solution. Towards the end of the 15th century, the Swiss mercenaries and German Landsknechts began to use long pikes deployed in square formations. Many other Western European powers quickly adopted this formation. It was not unlike the ancient Greek phalanx, but unlike its ancient counterpart, it had to deal with much more heavily armored mounted knights. Its depth was intended to both withstand the charges of these mounted noblemen in open field battles and to pack a punch when charging enemy infantry lines. During the 16th century, this formation made charging infantry ever more dangerous for mounted knights. The Black Riders found an unusual and only partly successful solution to this problem. Early on, they simply refrained from charging pike formations. Instead, they rode close to the formation in waves, fired their wheel lock pistols and returned to the rear of the formation. Nowadays, this tactic is called the caracol. In early modern sources, however, the term refers to various other maneuvers. John Crusoe, a contemporary military writer, for example, wrote that Caracol was a maneuver in which a formation of cuirassiers received an enemy's charge by wheeling apart to either side, letting the enemy rush in between the pincers of their trap and then charging inwards against the flanks of the overextended enemy. However, there is some disagreement among scholars regarding the Caracol tactic in the modern sense of the word. In the 1950s, the already mentioned Michael Roberts argued that the caracol tactic was merely a farce to keep the mounted nobles busy on the battlefield, because they were no longer needed as heavy lancers. In his opinion, infantry was now the battle-winning arm. More recent researchers, such as Clifford J. Rogers, Robert Frost or Ronald S. Lowe, usually agree with the sentiment that cavalry, especially lancers, had an increasingly hard time on the battlefield, at least in the West, and that infantry grew in importance. However, neither Roberts' notion that the caracol was merely a fake maneuver, nor that the lancer became entirely useless, is generally accepted anymore. Much of the disagreement is owed to the tiny effective range of the wheel lock pistol, which depending on the target is 0 to 3.5 meters, at most 5 to 10 meters. Even at a very close range, well-armored cavalrymen or pikemen were protected sufficiently against projectiles fired from these types of pistols. Historical manuals suggest usually to discharge the pistol only when one could see the white of the enemy's eyes, or to put the weapon directly against the enemy's armor. However, many infantrymen wore armor of poor quality or none at all. Experiments have shown that a lead ball fired from a wheel lock pistol could leave its barrel at up to 1000 joule, which implies that it would still wound or severely hurt a poorly armored man at 20 meters. But how did things look in practice? Let's have a look at the Battle of Dreux in 1562 as an example for 16th century cavalry warfare. It is one of the earliest armed conflicts in the Huguenot Wars. 19,000 men of the Catholic party clashed with 13,000 Protestants. Like most armies of the mid 16th century, both war parties had infantry which possessed only few firearms. The historian Geoffrey Parker notes that even up to the Thirty Years' War, most armies were still pike-heavy. Parker concludes that, quote, The use of firearms in the field remained in its infancy throughout the first half of the 16th century, end quote. However, at Dreux, the entire left flank of the Catholic army routed early, after a successful charge of the Protestant horsemen. The Swiss, in Catholic service, were the only ones still holding the center. However, they still counted very few skirmishers in their ranks, because of their infamous military conservatism. Thus, the caracol of the Black Riders, hired by the Protestant army, was quite effective against them. They did not break the Swiss formation, but they inflicted over a thousand casualties to their Swiss competitors. That is to say, a sixth of the Swiss mercenaries died. In the end, the sturdiness of the Swiss and the fact that the German horsemen preferred to plunder the baggage train of the French after they had annihilated the enemy cavalry still led to a Catholic victory. Nevertheless, the success of the Black Riders was a great surprise to the military commanders of the time. Soon, they became some of the most desired mercenaries of the French, Spanish and English monarchs. While other European armies usually appreciated that the caracol posed a threat to stationary pikemen, 
it quickly became apparent that this wasn't the case if enough musketeers were added to the pikes. Towards the end of the 16th century, the balance in pike and shot formations shifted in favor of shot, which is especially well documented in the Spanish tercios. The historian Geoffrey Parker explains that the ratio of shot to pike in the Spanish tercios fighting in the Netherlands shifted from two gunmen to five pikemen in 1571 to three gunmen to one pikeman 30 years later in 1601. Because muskets outranged wheellock pistols by a lot, it became increasingly dangerous to ride up at a trot to a pike and shot formation with masses of musketeers. However, the caracal did not become entirely useless. Clifford J. Rogers explains that a rolling caracal could pin down an enemy formation and that the assailing horsemen forced infantry formations to present their pikes to defend against a potential charge. This meant that they could not maximize their firepower against the enemy infantry by moving the shot to the first rows. Thus, the infantry had to halt their advance when threatened by a caracal, which in turn exposed them to artillery and musket fire. Moreover, the historian Ronald S. Love points to King Henry IV of France, who used his mounted cuirassiers in a Fabian strategy. The term Fabian strategy goes back to the war of attrition that was used by the ancient Roman dictator Quintus Fabius Maximus Verucosus. After the Romans had suffered devastating defeats against Hannibal, most famously at the Battle of Lake Trasimene, Quintus Fabius avoided large engagements when dealing with Hannibal's invasion of Italy. Similarly, Henry avoided conflicts if the odds were not in his favor and had his men strike at the enemy's columns at lightning speed and then retreat. In this scenario, a force armed with pistols makes sense. He also deployed other types of cavalry such as the demi-lancer and mounted arquebusiers. But Henry didn't shy away from open battle either. He frequently bested the enemy lancer formations by deploying his black riders and French cavalry six to seven ranks deep while the enemy lancers attacked in their usual two-rank deep formation, which is called onne in French. In the ensuing melee, the black riders were more mobile and could shoot up to six pistols. The swords of the lancers, in contrast, were not as effective in these melee engagements. Ronald S. Love points out that Henry IV had his own heavy cuirassiers and his German mercenary riders charged home with steel in hand frequently. And this leads us to a common misconception about cavalry in the 16th century. Many believe that from the 1560s onward, pistol-armed cavalry was only used to shoot and retreat. However, Ronald S. Love and Clifford J. Rogers argue that horsemen were usually expected to shoot and retreat for a few waves, before charging home with their swords and sabers as soon as there would be an opening. Take for example the English officer Francis Veer, who reports the following about the Battle of Turnhout in 1597. Quote, we charged our pikes, not breaking through them at the first push, as was anciently used by the men at arms with their barded horses. But as the long pistols delivered at hand, i.e. fired at very short range, had made the ranks thin, so thereupon the rest of the horse got within them. End quote. This statement makes it clear that cavalry was not used exclusively in simple shoot and retreat tactics in the years leading up to the Thirty Years' War. The Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus is often credited as the one who abandoned the caracol. That would date it to the 1620s and 30s. However, Rogers notes that this assumption is often based on failed cavalry charges, in which cavalry did not charge home due to lacking discipline or motivation leading them to retreat in a caracol-like manner. While Gustav was not the first to discard the caracol, he did order his Swedish horsemen and German mercenaries alike to charge home with steel in hand and popularized the shock value of cavalry charges once again. He had learned the value of such charges the hard way during his campaigns in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, where he frequently faced winged hussars who, remarkably enough, would go on using lances for many years. Yet both Gustavus's campaigns and the successes of the Hussars are topics for future videos.